give you a, a very brief introduction to the Wallace Center and its National Good Food Network. Uh, the Wallace Center, a business unit of Winrock International, is the host of the MGFN webinar series. The Wallace Center has been a leading organization in the movement for a more sustainable and equitable food system for over 25 years. Today, the center supports entrepreneurs and communities as they build a new 21st century food system that is healthier for people, the environment, and the economy. The center serves the growing community of civic, business, and philanthropic organizations involved in big, building a new good food system in the United States. In particular, we're focused on advancing regional collaborative efforts around the country to move good food, healthy, green, fair, affordable food beyond the direct marketing realm into larger scale wholesale channels. The NGFN is a key initiative of the Wallace Center that illustrates our market-based strategy. The NGFN is structured as a network of networks, ensuring efficient flow of information and innovation from boots on the project, boots on the ground projects to the national level and back down to the grassroots level across the nation. The Wallace Center coordinates and supports the network. Our vision rests on three pillars. We work with the growers, the buyers, and connect them. And using this value chain approach, we're able to increase grower viability, particularly small and medium-sized growers. Making these connections and deals adds economic vitality to the rural production areas, as well as the urban inner city depressed regions, getting more healthy food where it's needed most. This allows us to reach children and families in their communities. We serve as a national connector of people to people. We create, collect, and disseminate the best of the best knowledge and market-based technical assistance. For our our, for instance, our work co-leading the National Food Hub collaboration with USDA has led to the first national survey of these important businesses for regional food systems. We connect regions to funding, both by ensuring they know about national funding opportunities, but also by working to generate new opportunities. One example of this is the Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development, or HUFED Center, also housed at the Wall Center. The NGFN maintains a website and a database of people, organizations, and farmers to connect people within and across regions. Uh, this is another great networking tool. We work with companies interested in buying more regional good food. For instance, our work with the Cisco Corporation yielded more regional food into hospitals, inner city public schools, and other important outlets. We then document these models to allow others to learn and build upon our success. We build community. We gather people from different sectors together to share ideas and find common business interests. One example of this is our work just beginning in the South to build value chains. And we connect with other national networks to coordinate efforts and create synergy, accelerating this work and reducing redundancy. You should feel free to contact us any time. We are contact at ngfn.org. So without further ado, let's uh, jump into the meat of this webinar. Oh, and let me encourage you to ask your questions in that questions box when the questions occur to you. The Q&A section is at the end, but we will queue up your questions and ask them of your panelists then. Um, Gary Madison works for Farm Credit Council in Washington, D.C., which is the trade organization of the Farm Credit System. Farm Credit is a nationwide network of uh, borrower-owned lending institutions providing credit for the nation's farmers and ranchers. As the Vice President for Young Beginning Small Farmer Programs and Outreach, Gary seeks to identify and meet the needs of the next generation of farmers and ranchers as part of Farm Credit's enduring mission of service to agriculture and rural America. Farm Credit provided some $7.7 billion to young farmers, $12 billion for beginning farmers, and $14.2 in financing for small farmers. That was, those are 2008 numbers. Until recently, Gary was a small farmer operating a wholesale greenhouse business in New Hampshire, including raising cattle for the local freezer beef market. He holds a bachelor degree in agronomy and biology from the University of Connecticut. Gary, take it away. Thank you, Jeff. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, first slide is uh, I can get there is uh, thank you is I'd like to, to point out that uh, this tool for beginning farmers that, that I'm going to be talking about for just a little bit here is not just for beginning farmers but in, in creating this website um, with other partners we were looking to provide a resource for advisors and business partners and others so I want you to keep that in mind I'm going to keep referring to beginning farmers this, beginning farmers that, but really this is aimed at a larger audience. The partners in creating this website, which is uh, 
foodshedguide.org were uh, RMA through a, uh, a grant and also um, Jeff and others at the Wallace Center and here at Farm Credit. The purpose of this field guide website is uh, to give a, a tool for beginning farmers and their advisors and their lenders to figure out what it is in a food shed related business that they might like to do to have case studies in particular that would be able to illustrate uh, the, uh, uh, the, the capacity of different food shed related businesses and to allow growers to emulate or copy, if you will, some of those uh, facets that the, uh, are demonstrated in, in the case studies. So as I go through this presentation, I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be kind of like a tour guide. I'm going to be showing you some screenshots, like this one being the opening screen for the home screen for the website foodshedguide.org. And I don't really expect you to read everything on these screens. Um, I'll be talking over some of what's going on, but um, I just wanted you to to uh, think of this as as a tour guide presentation. The focus of the site, what I'd like to point out on this slide, is that it is about commerce. The focus of this site is about business, local food shed businesses, uh, primarily producers at this point, but we will be adding additional case studies. Now, the, as, as we thought about what it is that we should be describing on this website, uh, what tools we should be needing, we first had to consider that beginning farmers and ranchers, or BFRs, are not actually located in traditional ag areas. Um, they are based on ag census um, data here compiled in a map uh, by the Farm Credit Council. Beginning principal operators um, are located um, all over the country, of course, but 40% of those in the 2007 ag census are actually in metro counties. Uh, that is an increase over previous years. Um, Typically, uh, as a trend over time, it's been maybe 30% and now growing up to 40%. Um, so beginning farmers are located in different places. They're also growing non-traditional crops and are more likely to be doing small-scale direct-to-retail, which looking at, at this map of those farms reporting direct-to-retail sales, uh, you can see a high correlation again with um, the metro counties, the more urban areas. Uh, leading us to conclude that a lot of beginning farmers are going into direct retail sales sorts of businesses. And that is likely to be because of lower startup costs and higher margins in direct -to retail sort of business. So it's no surprise that uh, there are as many beginning farmers as there are in uh, uh, metro areas. And the challenge is um, how, do we, how do we provide solutions for them that can help explain the unique business models that they're in. And what we had decided on was a uh, case study based instruction and um, presenting those case studies in a way that allow people to basically copy them, to look at case studies and say, that's what I want to do. I understand from the case study, uh, here are the factors that I need, here are the par partnerships I need to make, uh, and then some more technical information on legal entity types and and structure, and also be a resource to some degree for USDA programs. So one of the main goals that we also saw was a need to explain what the heck we're talking about. What is a food shed business? Um, how do the pieces fit together? Um, and tell that story in a way that if a beginning farmer is going to enter into a, a local food shed type business, that this website would be a resource as far as helping them explain to their business partner, to their lender, to their family, uh, to potential partners um, and vendors and suppliers, what they're trying to accomplish in a food shed related business. To, to further explain that, we're also uh, included a, a, um, a more generic description of how this new American food shed uh, can be defined. What we're trying to do is provide background information, not that the beginning farmer doesn't have a concept of what they're getting into if they want a local food shed related business, but to give them a tool that can help explain it to others. 
So the particular objectives of this site are, are pretty clear. We wanted to have uh, uh, the capability to actually look deeper um, in a very strategic way at different food shed related businesses. So as a for instance, um, in this particular uh, uh, web page, you'll see that there are advantages and disadvantages listed here. Um, many of the, the, uh, the components of a food shed related business, or in this case, the marketing channel of direct to retail, uh, you can see the markets over there on the right hand side of the screen, uh, that we have definitions like this uh, on the website, are meant to illustrate a way of thinking, and demonstrate a way that beginning farmers can look at the problems that they may face and model patterns for how they're going to analyze situations. So I guess the model of this, this way of doing it is, if you sat down with a business consultant about a local food shed business, they wouldn't give you the answers. They'd ask you questions, and that's what we're trying to emulate in, in this sort of arrangement. Um, and then at the end of each uh, case study, which is this uh, particular screenshot is the end of a case study of a greenhouse business, um, there are key learnings that are extracted. So um, in reading the case study, if you didn't quite latch on to what the important facts are, um, we sort of summarized it at the end and uh, so that the, the key learnings can be easily extracted. Now, the, the, the big part design problem with any website is, okay, great information. How do I find it? How do I find the things that I need on there? And we organize the, the website around uh, the capabilities to search either the resources that you need for your business, uh, the business goals, for instance, I want to be in direct retail marketing or I want to be in uh, uh, a, uh, a brokerage type business in a food shed, um, or what are the market opportunities that are out there. So this, the site is approachable in different ways, but primarily as, um, as we were considering it through the idea of case studies. So uh, the list goes on a little further than the screenshot shows um, of, of case studies that um, are perhaps the most frequent way for a beginning farmer to enter into the website. Another way, <clears throat> as far as analysis of what's in the website um, and how to find the resources, is that the idea of a decision tree of, of being able to have the, the website assist the, the reader of the website to go through the, the process of making decisions about food shed related businesses. And then also, if you look over on the right hand side of the screen, uh, as far as resources, who did, who did this particular business, this again is a screenshot of the greenhouse um, case study, who did they use for advisors? Who did they link up with? Uh, where did they go? Where do they sell their stuff? Uh, uh, what are their markets that they use? So the information uh, in the website, hopefully, uh, contained in those case studies is approachable from a lot of different ways. But that's not enough. What do you do then? What do you accomplish um, as a beginning farmer or their advisor from looking at this website? If you've found an interest, uh, what's the next step? And that is to um, try to take the thoughts and put it into a business plan. Uh, this is, this is, again, the website is aimed at, at commerce, at business. So the next step after, gee, I've, I've seen this really cool case study, the next step is, okay, so how am I going to plan? How am I going to uh, accomplish the idea of, of stating the goals and setting some standards for performance and probably above all set realistic, and I would insert their business expectations. So. The tool that, that this website has on it is the one-page business plan. Now, I can almost hear you snickering out there about, okay, how am I going to do a business plan in one page? This is an exercise, and I'll, I'll skip right to it. Um, this is an exercise not in a complete business plan. This is meant to get somebody started. Uh, um, it's it's going to be rare for somebody to feel like they have to write an entire business plan just by approaching this website. But hopefully, with the one-page business plan and spending just enough time to read the short description on the website of how to fill this out, how to approach this, um, this is the kind of thing that, that can be printed off 
and uh, and approached as a real quick and easy way to begin a business plan, certainly not a complete one. The, the parallel to this is the one-page financial plan, which um, is pretty much in the same format, explaining here's how to fill this out. The um, rather different way, if you look on the, the box on the right-hand bottom corner that says 2011 budget, is that the approach that we're suggesting here is to start with what you want to earn. That would be the owner's draw. Um, what do you expect to get out of this business? And start with that as a goal, and then build your budget backwards from that point. Uh, this is not revolutionary necessarily. Uh, uh, you know, this is really basic business planning stuff. But to put the tool here and to put it in such a, a our goal was to put it in a concise way so that from a business planning perspective, a beginning farmer can look at this and say, okay, I really ought to start with what I want to earn um, so that there is certainly a business focus to this. As we're thinking about the the website, we're now engaged in an upgrade of the website, uh, what we're uh, calling phase two improvements. And in addition to adding more case studies, uh, there's you can see the uh, depth of information that we're um, hopefully going to add to this. And I would point out that that's a, that's a work in progress. Uh, we are going to be doing presentations in the upper Midwest on some of the business planning elements of this so that we're, we're essentially going to be out in the field uh, listening to beginning farmers as far as improvements. And we'd also encourage uh, that, well, let me go one more slide further, we'd encourage you to use the web page on foodshedguide.org to contact us if you have resources to suggest or uh, contacts, links. Uh, please let us know what you're thinking about uh, additions that we could make to the website. Uh, this is, again, a work in progress. We're going we're gonna to keep at this and keep trying to define what a food shed is and the businesses that uh, are opportunities for beginning farmers, explain how those businesses work in the real world from a uh, perspective of including case studies that would have financials with them. That's the, the main goal for our improvements, and thereby to expand the food shed uh, businesses that are available to young and beginning farmers. Uh, and those are our those are our uh, that's our existing work on creating this uh, foodshedguide.org website, and I encourage you to. Uh, to visit it and poke around, and then uh, don't forget that there's that suggestion page to give us some feedback. Jeff, uh, thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Gary. And um, again, feel free to send in those questions. We're going to have Jim uh, present now, um, and we will do the, the questions and answers for um, both presenters uh, as well as um, uh, a third expert on the um, on the call who I will introduce soon. Uh, but let me introduce Jim. Jim Slama is founder and president of FamilyFarmed.org, which encourages the production, marketing, and distribution of locally grown and responsibly produced foods and goods. FamilyFarmed.org expands the market for local farmers and local food producers by supporting trade buyers to purchase local food, training farmers, advancing the community-supported support agriculture movement, and playing an integral role in public policy in the state and region. Jim is editor of Wholesale Success, a farmer's guide to selling post-harvest handling and packing produce. The manual gives small to mid-sized growers technical assistance to help them develop the skills to sell produce into wholesale markets, and over 2,000 farmers are using it in their operations. Jim has also helped launch three operating produce aggregation facilities in 2011, and each of these food hubs is working with farmers to sell product to wholesale buyers. And we invited Jim here today to talk about one of his newest projects, the On-Farm Food Safety Project. Jim. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, and Gary, great tool. Congratulations on launching it. Uh, it's really uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here with Wallace. Um, it's our second presentation. And uh, we're excited to share with the audience uh, what's going on with our on-farm food safety project. Um, you know what? I don't have the capacity to advance right now, Jeff. 
Uh, there we go. Um, so uh, uh, we launched this pro product uh, project uh, about two years ago, and uh, did so basically because we were at a seminar. We were doing a wholesale success seminar at Cisco, uh, teaching farmers about you know creating food safety plans and. and you know, all the other aspects of what's necessary for um, uh, selling into wholesale markets. And we talked about this notion of getting GAP certified for food safety. And I said, and to do so, you're going to need your food safety manual, which the food safety certifier scores, and then comes out to your farm and, you know, double checks everything. And if you get enough points, then you'll get food safety certified. And at that point, I looked out into the audience, and I saw like this hook, this look of terror in many farmers' eyes. It's like, so you mean I have to write a book? And at that point, we realized, oh, we've got a bit of a problem here. And uh, you know, so we realized that this food safety manual and the technical skills necessary to create it was a real issue. So uh, soon thereafter, the On Farm Food Safety Project was born, and it's really all about. Uh, how do we create, um, uh, help farmers create food safety plans. So, um, Jeff, for some reason, I'm not able to, to advance this, if you can do that. Um, so, why do we have this? You know, there's a number of challenges in scaling up, which includes um, Number one, 95% of all food consumed flows through wholesale markets. Little of this comes from sustainable sources. Why is this? Um, number one, there's a lack of aggregation and distribution infrastructure. Number two, uh, not enough farmers. And number three, we've got concerns about food safety and the fact that uh, many growers aren't able to deliver on the food safety needs that farmers want. So uh, as a result of this, we've created a number of programs that support growers and wholesale buyers. Uh, these include, number one, our wholesale success program, which uh, and here's, a, here's a copy of the publication. It teaches farmers about things like uh, post-harvest handling, um, hacking, maintaining the cold chain, which is really crucial, as well as building relationship with wholesale buyers. Uh, as Jeff said, we've already trained over 2,000 growers across the country, either us and also partners, uh, with this wholesale success manual. And in fact, if, you're a, if you work with grower groups, uh, these trainings have been really successful uh, in helping farmers kind of go to the next level in wholesale markets. And uh, we've been very successful in getting funding, whether it be RMA funding, or especially crop funding and others. And certainly that's something we're interested in developing new relationships with people to uh, collaborate on. Um, and one of the nice things about the Wholesale Success Manual is that it's got crop by crop profiles of every crop grown commercially in the US. For example, here's spinach. And it takes farmers through you know, harvest tips uh, handling and packing standards, uh, how to cool, how to wash, uh, what kind of storage temperatures, humidity levels, all those types of things. So it's really a valuable tool. Uh, we've also been doing a lot of work on helping to develop pack houses. Uh, in 2011, we helped launch Blue Ridge Produce in Virginia, which actually is a 35,000 square foot facility uh, that already 50 farmers are selling into. Uh, we've got buyers like Whole Foods and Aramark and Chipotle that are that are buying and we're looking at buying and uh, it's it's been a success and we we think it's a, a real model for a larger scale food hub. In addition, in Kankakee and Peoria, we've uh, helped two farmers actually develop food hubs where they're working with their neighbors and they're ag aggregating produce from their neighbors. And then we're working with uh, Dane County in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, and exploring the feasibility of launching a food hub with them. Uh, now, the On-Farm Food Safety Project, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this is all about food safety plans. 
plants and how do we help farmers create their own customized food safety plan. So why do farmers need a food safety plan? You know, there's a number of things. Number one, uh, farmers need to utilize best practices in food safety, uh, no matter the size. Uh, number two, you don't want people getting sick, and we especially don't want people getting sick from food coming from small farms. Uh, I think that would be just a public relations disaster. Uh, and you know, for the most part, I think small farmers are using excellent food food safety best practices. Uh, what this tool does is going to help them develop a plan, put it down on paper, and codify those best practices. Um, in addition, um, in order to get GAP certified, uh, farmers need that food safety plan. So uh, this tool will help them create that. What are the elements of a food safety plan? Number one, it's got to be written. It's based on good agricultural practices uh, that are unique to that farm involves a comprehensive assessment of risk for food contamination within that operation and provides thorough documentation and records of how the food was handled and stored. Um, you know, when we first came up with this idea, uh, I had the good fortune to be at uh, a program on the West Coast. I met Drew and Myra Goodman, the founders of Earthbound Farm. You know, I told her about this conundrum, uh, told the uh, Myra, actually, and she said, well, you know, you need to meet Will Daniels, our VP of food safety. Uh, he's really an expert in food safety, and I think this might be something that Will would be interested in. So uh, connected with Will, you know, talked to him about this need to create this tool, uh, and he agreed to come on board and chair our technical advisory committee. Um, together, Will and I approach many leaders in food safety across the country, uh, and now, uh, as you'll see from the next slide, um, you know we work with many of the, the leading companies. Uh, you know, ranging from Chipotle, who's a founding funder, Cisco is a is a is a funder of the project. Um, Compass Group, the largest food service company in the world, is a major part of it. Uh, but then, you know, we have uh, you know Wallace was a was a strategic partner. In a funder, uh, you know, folks like NSF, uh, big uh, agricultural consultants, experts in food safety, the Organic Center, Produce Marketing Association, uh, many representatives of big produce. But interestingly, we also got many representatives from small produce as well. Uh, so, you know, sitting at the same table, you know, with United Fresh and, and Produce Marketing Association. And Western Growers was the Wild Farm Alliance and CAF uh, and Farm Aid, and so you know it's been an exciting process working with all of these different partners together, both big and small produce, to develop this tool. And one of the other things that we were excited about was we actually got to link the tool development with the harmonized GAP standards that were developed by United Fresh which essentially took multiple um, GAP standards and food safety protocols, uh, internationally harmonized them, and created one standard that by consensus of over 50 different players um, you know, created a standard. We then used that standard to develop this tool. So uh, if you go to www.onfarmfoodsafety.org, you know, this is the pop-up screen. Uh, and um, you know, basically, it, it takes people through a process of creating a food safety plan. You know, just want to acknowledge that USDA Risk Management Agency was a key uh, funder, as well as many indus industry sponsored. Um, and uh, so, not only does it help people create this food safety plan, but it also includes a lot of information about food safety and useful resources. Um, so you know, here's uh, the primary screen. Um, what we're going to take you through now is this process of how this works to help create a food safety manual. So um, this is the kind of the startup screen. People have to register, and then once they've registered, then it takes us takes them through this process of asking a series 
of yes and no questions uh, in key areas of risk that um, pertain to food safety. Uh, you know, some questions include text boxes, uh, and then the information entered will appear in the food safety plan. And uh, there are 11 key areas of critical risk uh, that are covered in the plan. And as I mentioned earlier, these line up with United Fresh's standards. They include general requirements, worker health and hygiene, previous land use and site selection, agricultural water, agricultural chemicals, animals and pest control, soil amendments and manure, field harvesting, transportation, packing house activities, and then final product transport. What's really cool is that, for example, this page uh, is uh, about sanitation, worker sanitation. So, you know, as part of a section in sanitation, there's questions pertaining to it. And then, you know, we ask, okay, you know, have you trained your employees in sanitation? Uh, if it's yes, great, which it needs to be, uh, because, you know, clearly hand washing is a big deal. And then we have a sample form that people can actually fill out. And when they train their employees how to wash their hands, they get everybody to fill out, yes, in fact, we were at this training. And, uh, you know, we get uh, in their name and signature. So not only does it codify this is what needs to happen and what needs to happen, but it also provides uh, the documentation so that could be uh, presented to a GAP auditor uh, if, in fact, people choose to get GAP audited. Um, there's a number of other form templates, and each risk area actually includes these forms and training material templates to help document food safety policies, training logs, and various checklists. Uh, and all these documents are uh, easily reformatted and adjusted to the needs of each individual operation. Um, for many of these things, there are best practices included. And uh, the best practices, in some cases, are automatically included in the manual. Uh, and in other cases, uh, the farmer has the choice of whether or not to include them. For example, here's proper hand washing techniques, uh, and um, you know most people opt to have this included in, in their manual. And if somebody isn't complying with what are considered to be best practices in food safety, uh, we give them a pop-up. And so if they answer no to a question that should be yes, uh, we let the user know that this is a non-compliance and will be re reflected in their food safety plan. Uh, and any documents that are a no uh, go into a section at the end of their plan that uh, basically lets them know what they need to work on and quite honestly what they will not receive scores uh, what they will not receive scores on uh, if, in fact, they do choose to be GAP audited. Uh, so here's an example of a food safety plan. And uh, it's much bigger than this. This is page one. Uh, but one of the nice things is people can view their manual online. Once it's complete, they can save it as a PDF. At any point in time, they can go in and edit the manual. Uh, they can answer incomplete questions, and there's a checklist then of things that need to be completed. Uh, so, you know, saving, here's the checklist. Uh, so this is a really good thing. You know, once they've completed the, the manual, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm going to need to uh, provide them documentation of my water testing. And so, you know, basically this lets them know, okay, these are all the things that I still need to complete. And once they've completed that and the manual, then they're ready to, if they choose to, you know, give everything to a, a, a food safety certifier. And then that process, we believe, is going to lead to a food safety uh, certification. Uh, this process also has a whole resources section, which includes typical audit questions, 
annual specific do documents and useful links to assist farmers uh, to uh, improve their food safety plan. Here's my contact information. Uh, again, we're, we're very grateful for your interest in this. Uh, we're interested in collaborating with partners, not only in uh, you know, wholesale success trainings, but also trainings around uh, this manual, because we think that uh, you know, it's really critical that small farmers develop food safety plans, adopt these best practices in food safety. And if there are folks out there who are interested in collaborating on those kind of trainings, uh, we're certainly um, interested in doing so. Great. Um, uh, thank you, Jim. That was excellent. Um, so let me uh, open up the Q&A. Um, there are some excellent questions already posted. Thank you. Um, and let me remind you to use that questions box over in the control panel. If the control panel is collapsed and you're not seeing these, uh, there, there have been several questions answered uh, already in text form, and that'll also show up in your questions box. So if you see on the far right-hand side of your screen, there's a little uh, small bar with the orange arrow on the top pointing out towards your screen. Click that uh, and it'll expand the control panel. Um, and also let me bring our uh, third panelist uh, in the conversation. Will Daniels uh, is with us. He's been with Earthbound Farms since 1999. He's helped the company grow from small regional sal salad producer to the nation's largest grower, packer, and shipper of organic produce. As Earthbound Farms Senior Vice President of Operations and Organic Integrity, Daniels is responsible for operations, manufacturing, distribution, distribution and facilities, and food safety, food quality, and the company's organic integrity program. As the leader of Earthbound Farms Industry Leading Food Safety Program, Will is a sought after speaker and has addressed key issues in food safety in the produce industry at meetings of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Restaurant Association, the Institute of Food Technologists, and the International Association for Food Protection, and now on this NGFN webinar. Will is the chair of the technical advisory team for the on-farm food safety project, and uh, so he's, he's here to add, answer um, some technical questions um, that you throw at him. So, um, let me uh, let me open up the question now. Don't forget that these are uh, for um, for Gary uh, and uh, the Food Shed Guide uh, website, and also for Jim and Will on the On Farm Food Safety Project. Um, so uh, let me Gary, let me open up with a question for you. Um, Hannah asked about um, farm credits experience, giving loans to these kind of farmers. Um, by which I understand Hannah to mean um, non-commodity uh, market farmers. Sure, and that, um, uh, Jeff, that, <clears throat> that experience um, and practice varies around the country because Farm Credit is actually 84 different local lending institutions that are have different geographic territories in the country. So you'll, you'll find that, the, as a for instance, in the Northeast, uh, there is a great deal of experience. A large portion of the portfolio of farm credits lending currently is involved in uh, food shed type businesses, uh, direct to retail, and all of that. In fact, all the all of the East Coast is uh, really heavily saturated. Is this the the uh, an increasing part of the West Coast um, where there is commodity agriculture? Um, there is certainly more experience with that than there is with this kind of of business, of uh, local food shed sorts of businesses, but that is uh, that is changing with the uh, uh, with farm credit institutions seeking to learn more about these businesses, and that's part of my job is transmitting uh, things like uh, uh, financials for these sorts of businesses, which will be on the food shed guide website. As, as well as uh, analyses from existing farm credits that are finding these to be uh, profitable businesses and are willing to lend to them. So uh, I can't say everywhere all the time farm credit has, every loan officer has experience with, with these types of businesses, but we're uh, certainly working hard to, to change that. 
Okay, and Gary, let me uh, ask this question of you and then uh, over to Jim. Um, uh, we have a question about how how you your outreach plan to let growers know um, about the existence of these sites. So Gary, why don't you why don't you take that and then we'll go over to Jim. Sure. This is uh, uh, again. I'd like you to think about this. We're not just trying to reach out to beginning farmers, but also to their advisors, um, other lenders, uh, to FSA. Uh, this USDA is is well aware of this and of of this website. Of course, they funded it, and uh, Deputy Secretary Merrigan is particularly interested in making sure that Farm Services Agency lenders are well aware of these case studies and that the uh, that Farm Credit is already lending to these types of businesses, and and FSA should be looking into these also. So. Um, the distribution to beginning farmers, uh, this is available to uh, and, and being made better known to all farm credit institutions so that they have it as a tool for both instruction and for offering a, a resource to local beginning farmers, as well as we're trying to help USDA, encourage USDA to um, let their lenders know about it also. Uh, of course, the uh, probably one of the most uh, most current thing we're doing is being on this webinar and, and uh, speaking with all of you and hoping that that those of you who are involved in in nonprofits or or associated with young farmer groups would just pass this uh, website along as a resource both of them along as, as a resource uh, to uh, to your clientele and Jim um, we're actually launching the tool publicly. I guess we're launching it publicly now, but it's still in kind of final beta uh, form. And uh, we actually have a couple of farmers who have completed plans and will be um, testing it with both a USDA inspector as well as a NSF auditor over the next two weeks. Uh, that'll be finalized and then we're we're launching the kind of to the media and the public the fact that okay it's done it's ready to go and we want to invite farmers to use it it's free and uh, you know we hope it's a valuable tool for you so we're going to be doing that in mid mid December uh, we're going to be reaching out to you know all the small farm groups we're going to be you know reaching out to farm uh, farm bureau and you know, using as many USDA channels of uh, communications and media as we can possibly, you know, since they're a major supporter and funder of this project, uh, they believe in it and they want to get that word out as, as much as possible. So uh, basically starting in mid-December and, you know, moving then into the uh, you know, farm conference season, we're going to be promoting the heck out of this as much as we can. So uh, farmers recognize that it, it's there and it's um, able to be used by them for free. There's a question about um, some farmers being resistant uh, to um, creating a food safety plan. Um, there's particular reference to organic farmers, but um, do you have any advice? This is from Luisa. Do you have any advice for our uh, attendees for encouraging people to to create a gap plan? Sure. Will Will, do you want to take that one? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, thanks for thanks for having me. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, provide some input today. Um, the, the the first answer is that the uh, the pathogens that that make people sick don't differentiate between small and and large operations. Um, it's true that the uh, that the certification process for uh, for organic uh, certification does cover some some practices that that lead to sound food safety practices, but it certainly doesn't address address all of them. Uh, 
we uh, do our best. I, I also serve on, as chair of the board of California Certified Organic Farmers, so I represent um, over 2,000 uh, small growers and, and know uh, of their concerns and, and hear it very loud and clear. Um, really, the, the biggest answer is that the, the bacteria doesn't differentiate. Um, the difference is the scale or the scope of the contamination risk. Um, and it also depends upon how that product is being marketed. Um, for example, a company like Earthbound Farm that's putting product into a, a bag or a rigid plastic clamshell, um, it's a much different risk uh, than a, a small grower who who's, uh, has a farmer's market uh, program and he's selling an unwashed, not ready to eat product. Um, so it's really about understanding those risks and a food safety plan helps the grower better understand those risks and put tools in place that will prevent them, or prevent or, or reduce the risk uh, from becoming a reality. And, and can, can uh, there's a question about using their food safety plan as a sort of a, a market promotion uh, technique, um, saying, yeah, we are a GAP certified, or is that, is that legal? Um, it, does it protect them against liability? What what goes along with being certified? Well, I think that it's certainly, um, while we don't want to use food safety as a competitive advantage, um, I would say that uh, companies use it as a competitive advantage. Um, certainly the uh, California and Arizona uh, lettuce uh, growers um, did so by developing the Leafy Greens Marketing Agreement, which is really a food safety plan for uh, uh, large-scale lettuce lettuce producers, um, they they uh, so so I would say that it is a marketable uh, program once you do have certification and a food safety plan in place. Well, you know, and the other thing to consider is the fact that increasingly buyers, wholesale buyers, are demanding either a food safety plan or increasingly some form of GAP certification. And so if growers want to participate in that marketplace, um, they're going to need to put forth at least what they're doing in terms of best practices and in many cases uh, quantify those best practices with a plan, with all their documentation, and then get food safety certified. Uh, and so, and that's totally a choice of the growers. Right now it's completely voluntary. And some growers are recognizing, you know what, these wholesale markets is where I'm at or where I want to be, and I'm going to do that. Uh, and others are choosing not to, and, uh, you know, and if they are strictly selling in direct markets, they certainly, uh, at this point, there's no government requirement to develop a food safety plan. However, down the road that may change. You never know with the you know, Food Safety Modernization Act, the implementation of it is going to be coming over the next couple of years and there may be more regulations in this realm. Uh, my sense is that you know, a farmer can use this tool and create a plan within a few hours. Uh, might take a little bit longer to, you know, get all the records and all that stuff together. I think it's a really good investment of time. It's going to lessen their risk, and it's going to create tools that, you know, will help them and their employees follow best practices in food safety. And uh, I think those are good things for everybody. And I think that's um, that's a characteristic that these two tools share. It's um, it's not a a ton of time, but it's a huge leg up. Um, it's a, a small amount of time, a relatively small amount of time, um, c creates a huge benefit. Gary, I'm I'm interested to know um, if uh, lenders look at uh, food safety plan as part of a, a criteria for for giving a loan is that sort of does that reduce risk uh, yeah it's it's it, it does it, it's certainly part of a business plan to uh, mitigate risk and it also shows an awareness of the marketplace it's a um, one of those 
catastrophic contingencies, I guess. You know, if you have a if you have a food safety problem, it's a really big problem. You just, uh, but it's it's un, at the same time it's uncommon. Uh, kind of like the the uh, farming equivalent of a of a hurricane, I guess that doesn't hit very often, but when it does, it's disastrous. So um, attention to those sorts of details in a business plan are essential because one of the one of the major differences in lending to a food shed related business that's engaged in direct to retail is that uh, the, the, the whole concept of lending is very different from a commodity farm that's based on acres and bushels per acre or whatever the metric is for that crop because a direct to retail business is based on a marketing plan uh, very different approach for lending and what the contingencies are for that marketing plan become extremely important. So if you're saying you're gonna you're gonna sell everything through your farm stand, well, what if you have a fire? Uh, what if uh, the, you know there's road construction and nobody can get to your farm stand? What are the other options you have for markets? All of those things are are very important to have in a business plan when you're talking about retail sales because those the, the business really isn't isn't worth a lot unless that stuff is sold by the grower. That's the whole point of, of uh, direct to retail sales. Uh, it's not like a commodity where the, the, the whoever the lender is can go out and harvest the crop or, or recover the crop from a silo or storage bin. Uh, for direct to retail, it's all about marketing. Um, there are two questions really. Um, that I'm going to try to unite. Um, w one question is uh, urban growers uh, looking for uh, getting credit who often don't own their land um, seems to be a problem. And the other question um, is um, about landowners finding good family farmers uh, to farm on their land. So it, I, I guess they're, they're united in the, in the way that uh, there are, uh, you know, the farmers not find farming their uh, their own land. So access to credit, and then uh, how how one can find the other. Well, you know, um, I, I want to sound like too much of a broken record, but a business plan is is not just for um, not just for communicating with your lender. Uh, it should be something that. Uh, a farm business manages from or manages by, uh, and it's also a communications tool. So if if a young farmer out there is is looking to find uh, land uh, that is uh, or looking to find land that they can farm at a at a lower cost, or someone who's sympathetic to the idea that they're going to farm and sell locally, um, having a good business plan that explains their vision. And explains how they're going to make money on it on a given quantity of land is extremely important, so that a potential uh, lessor of that land, or, or uh, somebody who's going to let them use their farm or rent the farm to them, can see how they're serious and how that they're looking at sustainability not just in terms of how they're going to treat the soil and, and how they're going to grow their crops, but also from the sense of sustainability being economic sustainability. So even though someone may be looking at a triple bottom line in, in terms of, of attracting a, a really good young farmer to a piece of land um, and, and willing to sign on to the mission, they also have to be assured that that young farmer is going to make enough money to be able to feed themselves and, and raise a family and, and, or whatever other goals they may have uh, that, are, uh, that require some earnings. Uh, as far as urban farms, um, I think, you know, one of the things to point out is that although it is it's certainly true that it's unlikely for an urban farmer to, to want to get a mortgage to buy the land because it's, it's likely to be extremely expensive, um, is that the, the credit needs of an urban farmer are probably much lower. And uh, farm credit's not the only or FSA or you know a, a larger capacity lender is not the only uh, source of credit and may not in fact be appropriate for a very small amount of credit if the urban farm is uh, I don't know let's say a quarter of an acre 
and the needs are for a few pieces of small equipment or rototiller. Um, there may be other sources of credit. Um, you know, if we're only talking a few thousand dollars, I know people are going to cringe when I say this, but a credit card may be the right source of credit as long as you have a plan that you know you're going to borrow that money in the spring and you're going to pay it off by when you when you have enough cash flow in July or August from from crop sales. So. Uh, the source of the credit is also an important consideration that is appropriate to the scale of the, the credit need. Um, that was a lot of information there, <laughs> excellent. Um, uh, there, uh, Jim, there are a couple questions, a couple people wanting to know how to buy the Wholesale Success Manual. Do you want to tell them how to do that? Sure. Um, Actually, if they go to our website, um, familyfarmed.org, uh, they can find it. Um, let's see. Why don't I go there myself? Um, Well, it's it's a link on on familyfarm.org. Yeah, there's there's a link on uh, under programs. If if they look up programs, uh, okay, they'll find up uh, find a link to wholesale success there. And it's it's for fee, right? Yeah, it it costs um, uh, fifty dollars plus shipping. Unless okay. people buy ten or more, and then it's forty dollars. Uh -huh. Okay, and there's no nonprofit rate or anything. No, it's a 250-page manual, and it's yeah. really okay. heavy and really comprehensive. So, uh, yeah, okay, uh, it's uh, we think it's worth it. Okay, um, uh, is there any plan, or does does there exist um, a uh, traceability element uh, to the uh, food, on farm food safety project? Uh, certainly, there's a component of traceability built into the plan, uh, which, I mean, there's requirements for farmers to uh, have systems for traceability and even uh, perform a mock traceability uh, uh, recall. So there are components to it. Uh, Will, do you want to say more about you know, kind of how that works and the, the whole traceability angle? Yeah, it, it is uh, part of the, uh, certainly part of a sound food safety plan, and, and it does provide some guidelines on how to set up uh, traceability and what kind of, um, what what elements you need uh, to ensure that you can pro that you can perform the trace back and that you have all of the necessary components within that trace back, um, there, there is a, a section that, that, that provides that. Okay, great. Um, a question for, uh, for both teams. Um, uh, Kathy has a nonprofit giving garden um, and she asks uh, what she should be doing in terms of both food safety and business planning um, and uh, she's looking to grow. So um, do you want to, the well, on farm food safety team want to go first? Yeah, this is Will. I'll jump in first and, and say that, um, you know, from my perspective, nobody should, uh, should ignore um, food safety, regardless of s scale, regardless of, uh, of profit or non-profit, regardless of crop that they're growing. Um, it's important that you understand the risks in your operation and do what you can to protect those risks. Um, so I, I, if, if it were me, I would work to put a food safety plan in place. Um, and in a lot of cases, uh, the risk may be very low. Um, if you're growing artichokes, for example, um, you know, the, the, the food safety risks are pretty low because consumption of raw artichokes, as far as I know, is, is far to none uh, and, and uh, slim to none. And, and, the, um, and, and so uh, if you were doing artichokes versus, um, you know, baby greens or sprouts, uh, your risk is much different. And, and so understanding what, what crop you have and what the potential risks are is a place to start, and this on-farm food safety tool, being a free tool to anybody, um, would really help you 
determine whether or not you have uh, greater risk or less risk depending upon the crops that you're growing. And and with that reduced risk, um, is uh, does that mean farmers have to pay less for um, insurance? Uh, that's a great question. Um, the, there, there was questions in there that, that said, you know, if, if I had a food safety plan in place, does it mean my liability insurance goes down? Um, I, I'd say that that really is up to your insurer and the, um, the vigor or rigorousness of your uh, food safety plan. Um, Earthbound has, has been able to get our liability insurance uh, reduced by demonstrating that we have a plan that goes far beyond what industry's expectations are. I'm not necessarily convinced that by just having a food safety plan in that you're going to be able to reduce your liability, um, but, but that would be really up to the operator and the insurer. Okay. Um, there's a, a question about um, if aquaponics is covered in the tool. Yeah, I, I did get a, an answer out to that. It's not included okay. in the tool. Um, there are no standards for aquaponics and uh, uh, and produce uh, combined. Um, but the but that being said, the plan does account for uh, operations that are both. Uh, animal and uh, and and produce um, driven um, agriculture. So I think that you could use the tool um, and um, you know just replace uh, livestock with fish, and and you'd probably end up in the same place. That being said, we haven't tested it for that particular application. Um, but really, again, and I I hate to sound like a broken record, but it's identifying the risks. Um, associated with the fish, if you were using the fish a, a, as a source of of nitrogen for your uh, for your aqua aquaculture, uh, you know the the risk would be the the fecal material that that comes with that that excellent fertilizing uh, source. So it's really understanding those risks and then applying controls that would uh, prevent or or reduce the risk from becoming uh, contaminant on your produce. And uh, just for our attendees, when Will said he got an answer out, um, Will and others have been uh, typing answers out. So if, if you're missing over in your questions box, there are some, uh, there's a whole other wonderful source of information uh, from our panelists. Um, there's a question here about other food safety certifiers other than the USDA, and why would uh, a farmer use or not use them? Uh, the USDA um, uh, is is one source. Um, they they have a, a certification program. There's also third party certifiers out there that uh, that can provide uh, certification uh, to your plan. Um, uh, NSF, uh, what is it called, Jim? Agricultural Services. Now uh, they they're formerly known as Davis Fresh Technologies. Um, Primus Labs. There's there's several out there that will provide provide um, auditing and inspection. Um, and actually, with the that tool said, has a, whole, has a whole list of them all. Um, yeah, exactly. There's yeah. a list of resources on the website. Um, it, it, that being said, though, I, I would like to throw out a a cautionary note that um, having an inspection and being certified doesn't mean that uh, that you are safe. It's it's all about following the plan that you have in place. And really uh, vetting that that plan to as many people as possible to get as much feedback as possible. On farm food safety plan is a great place to start. Several people have provided input into that. Um, but but if you look at the the cantaloupe uh, outbreak, for example, or or other outbreaks and and recalls that have been happening, uh, all of these operations have been inspected and certified and passed those certifications. Uh, the inspection and audit process is a snapshot in time. It's really what you're doing the other 364 days of the year that count. <laughs> well said. Um, do you each want to talk about how you'll offer technical assistance to people who use the tools? Um, so maybe um, Jim, we'll start with you and then hand off to Gary. Sure. Um, 
you know, right now we don't have funding to offer that technical assistance. Um, so, you know, we're launching the tool, and people are pretty much on their own in terms of figuring out those, you know, how to use it and what the next steps are. Our goal is to get some funding so we can at least go to all the small farm conferences uh, to promote this and, you know, reach out to people. And then eventually, um, you know, our goal is to have um, folks like Extension and others actually utilize the tool, invite people into their office, and say somebody's not computer fluent, but they want to use this tool, you know, an extension agent hopefully would work with them and help them create that. So that, that's a longer term thing. We're still figuring out that strategy and, you know, how to encourage that. But uh, for now, you know, it's pretty much a standalone tool that we hope people will figure out how to use. Uh, and if, if I could add to that, Jim, the, we, we are committed, though, to maintaining the technical committee. And so the, the tool will be updated uh, and revised uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, and uh, I, I want to echo Jim's um, thoughts about the extension specialists from the land-grant universities. Um, I think that this is probably an excellent tool for them to put into their quiver um, to provide that outreach uh, extension uh, help to the small growers. And Jeff, I'd, uh, this is Gary, I'd say likewise for uh, mm -hmm. extension to be familiar with the food shed guide uh, as, a, as a way to inform themselves if they're, if they're not aware of those kind of businesses by going through the case studies, but also to be able to refer people to it. Um, uh, the capabilities of extension are different in different states, so it's, it's certainly not a, uh, not a blanket s solution to say, uh, oh, extension will take care of it. Uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons why websites like, like what Jim has put together and the, the uh, field guide or food shed guide website are, are being developed because in some places extension has been starved for funds and they no longer have the, the direct farmer contact capability that they used to. Uh, so um, relating that to what's on the food shed guide website, there is a contact email um, on the website for questions. And if we were to get a, a large flow of emails through that, then we'd certainly think about uh, expanding that capacity. But that's that's how we're dealing with those questions now. Or uh, as you can see on the, the one-page business plan, my email is actually right on the, on the one-page business plan. So uh, that's another way to get a hold of me as far as being able to, uh, um, if I can't answer the question, then to be able to respond or refer you, whoever's asking the question to a local farm credit uh, loan officer or staff person who could answer the question. I also wanted to point out that in the post-webinar survey, just to get a sense, um, we, we do have a question uh, if you'd like in your local area to, to have a training. Um, this is, there's uh, there are no, no promises being made, um, but, but um, if it f turns out that there are um, several people and organizations within an area, um, we, we might see if we can uh, put something together um, for, for that. Um, <clears throat> there is a question about uh, uh, food safety and uh, food hubs. Um, Sally asks uh, if there are farmers coming together at a, at a food hub. Um, does everyone have to have an individual food safety plan, or is there some uh, some way to do group food safety? Uh, I, I can speak to that from our experience with helping to develop some food hubs. Um, number one, if it's an aggregation facility, uh, in since most of them are selling to larger scale wholesale buyers, the facility itself is going to need to get GAP certified. And depending on if there's processing or meat or dairy going through there, they also might need to be HACCP certified. Um, secondly, increasingly, aggregators are looking for farmers that are selling into it to get GAP certified. Uh, at Blue Ridge, for example, um, of the 50 farmers, I think over 15 of them uh, in the past year 
got GAP certified, including quite a few Amish growers who were selling into it. And they just did it because number one, they want to, you know, they want to adopt these best practices and put it down on paper. Uh, and two, they realized that increasingly buyers are looking for it. So uh, I don't think it's possible to have a group certification, uh, in part because the certifier actually certifier actually needs to go to the farm to review their practices and make sure that what they say on paper in the food safety plan is actually lining up with what they're doing. Uh, but there could be ways to help minimize the costs by people in one area getting together, working with the USDA or another private certifier, and having the visit of the certifier take place on the same day, or maybe over two days if there's quite a few farms in a given region. Uh, one of the more um, extensive costs that I've seen in that gap certification process actually is the travel time. You know, depending on where the certifier is, there could be three or four hours of travel at 95 hours built into uh, uh, a gap uh, cost. And therefore, if a number of farms are actually sharing in that travel cost, uh, it could knock down the cost per farmer significantly. That's a great idea. Well, uh, we are out of time, so let me just do a, a big thank you to Jim, to Will, and to Gary, um, and um, tell you uh, that um, our, uh, this webinar is uh, being recorded and it will be archived on ngfn.org slash webinars. Uh, there are nearly three dozen other webinars we've done in the past, so you should feel free to point others who you think would like to have heard this panel uh, and uh, tour, uh, browse by topic uh, for other other webinars that we've done in the, the past dig into whatever interests you. We do do these webinars on the third thir Thursday of each month starting at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time. However, uh, this December we are taking a holiday break, uh, but we are extremely excited about our uh, 2012 season. The easiest way for you to make sure you hear about our upcoming webinars and other Wall Center activities is to sign up for our mailing lists. And the easiest way to do that is to ask us to add you on the survey that should pop up after this webinar ends. I want to let you know about two other Wall Center websites. Foodhub.info, .info, not .com, is a food hub hub of information. Research, case studies, a map of the many food hubs across the country, which we'll be soon be updating. Uh, there's even links to TA providers with experience in aggregation and distribution. And I want to note that if you are a TA provider or a consultant on the call, you should take some time and create or update your profile on ngfn.org. This is becoming an established place for those in need of assistance to find their help. So should be listed there. There are over 180 individuals and organizations uh, already listed and that number is growing. And our recently launched hufed.org site, our site for the Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development Center run by the Wallace Center. This program and website is focused on increasing access to food to underserved communities using market-based solutions. On the site you'll find a description of the initiative, grantee profiles and photos, and a library of some of the best food access resources. If you have a resource you'd like to share, let us know. Contact at ngfn.org or hufed at winrock.org. You can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. I'd like to encourage you to add your name uh, to that database. Uh, and if you haven't, sign up for our email updates. Again, uh, in the post-webinar survey, uh, just let us know that you'd like to be kept up to date. Well. Thank you very much to all of our uh, panelists, and we will see you uh, in January. Take care. The organizer has ended the session, and this call will be.